Thank you for listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg, Queen of Perpetual Help, and welcome to a special episode of WQPH's Local Matters. On this episode, we bring you part two of our special guest host, Talk Catholic's Tim Kilcoin, interviewing Father Carney. And he is talking about sacramentals and some important messages you should know about our Catholic faith. Without further ado, here is Talk Catholic's Tim Kilcoin and Father Carney. This is Tim Kilcoin of Talk Catholic, and we're going to continue on now with our part two with the interview of Father Larry Carney talking about the devotion to the holy face of Jesus. Let us begin. Ave Maria, indeed. Father Tim Kilcoyne, it is the hour of mercy. (laughs) We need as much of it as we possibly can. This is WQPH Radio, and we are filling in the gaps relative to our first interview with Father Larry Carney, a Benedictine of the Apostles of Mary. Do I have that correct? Yep, chaplain of the Benedictines of Chaplain of the Benedictines of Mary, Queen of Apostles, and out in Wichita, out in Wichita. That's right. The God's good people out there. (laughs) 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 Why don't you lead us off, Father? We're going to bounce around a little bit and uh, see where we go for Jesus through Mary. And why don't you lead us off with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All right. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost. Very good, Father. Thank you again. Because not everybody, not the whole world, might have heard our first session, (laughs) always probably give us just a quick synopsis historical on the devotion to the Holy Face. Father has written a book. The Holy Face, the devotion destined to save the world. That's a pretty lofty goal. (laughs) And how did you come up with that title? I'm curious. And yeah, go ahead and give us a little primer on the beginnings. Yes, so Pope Blessed Pius IX said that reparation was destined to save society. Okay. And so I got his cue, put that as the subtitle of my book, but I changed it a little bit and I said, the devotion destined to save society because the devotion of the holy face was given by jesus to sister mary saint pierre as a devotion of reparation and the object being the holy face of jesus where all five of his senses are pointed and where he suffered so much during his passion for us mm. St. Mary de St. Pierre, I was looking on the internet and noticing there were some parallels between her and St. Therese. Can you speak to that a little bit and their devotion to the Holy Face? So Sister Mary St. Pierre, yeah. uh, she was a very harm, humble Carmelite, and Jesus Christ began to give her what is called intellectual locutions, yeah. intellectual visions. Okay which theologians say is probably the highest in the extraordinary phenomena. Okay. And they're very rare. So Private revelations. The, yeah, they're private revelations, of course. Anything after St. John the Evangelist is private revelation. Yep. So yeah, these are intellectual revelations. And Jesus was just telling her over the course of five years some things that we need to know to fight the battle in the future. And Jesus gave us this blueprint of the counter-revolution right during the time the Communist Manifesto was being published and was being promulgated. So Jesus specified to Sister that this devotion was a devotion to attack communism. Okay. And he rarely calls out, in private revelation, he rarely calls out people by a specific name he usually is more general okay so this is a this is definitely some beautiful information and in private revelation we can take it or leave it yeah with the deposit of faith which is what came from the gospel uh, and what jesus revealed that we have to that faith we have to believe or else mm. 
probably should we could take it or leave it. Right. But in my observation, five revelations that are proved, is proved by local bishops is generally really helpful for us. Absolutely, absolutely. It certainly helps in the area of meditation, doesn't it? You know, these things may not be affirmed as dogma or doctrine, but they can certainly enhance your gaze prayerfully, for sure. Give us again uh, just a little bit of your beginnings with this devotion now and how it got started. Yeah, I was just at Abbey in Gower, Missouri, yep. where I was the chaplain for eight and a half years. Okay. And of course now... The nuns are expanding, so they're looking to Wichita to be a place. So I was talking to Mother and the Priors, and the Priors is the one that introduced me to this devotion. And what's interesting is I read in the biography of Sister Wilhelmina, that African-American nun who is unofficially incorrupt, though she hasn't been approved as being corrupt, but I saw her. Did you? And after being buried for four years, awesome. her face is so beautiful. Awesome. And that's the same for all the nuns, because her face has a certain glow to it. Yeah. Anyways, my point is, in her biography, it was mentioned that she was a member of the Arch, a member of the Confraternity of the Holy Face. Okay. So I asked Sister if she had the enrollment forms, and she brought them, and she enrolled in the Confraternity of the Holy Face, hosted by the Farmalites of Dallas, Texas. Okay. And she signed up in February of 1977. Mm. And then I contacted the Carmelites there in Dallas. They're still there yeah. uh, this weekend, and they confirmed it. And they sent me a picture of the role because they used to type it out. And there it is, Sister Wilhelmina. Nice. So this devotion has nine promises, and one of them is there will be many miracles. Okay. So... This is a miracle that's in the working right now of the incorrupt body of Sister Wilhelmina. Yeah, I saw a picture of her, <laughs> just like St. Bernadette. <laughs> she, yes, exactly. She, she's resting beautifully, looks like she's just go, taking a nap. <laughs> yeah, she's on the front page of that traditional tan book called The Incorruptible. Yes, and, I have it in the kitchen on know, the, by, right on the front table. <laughs> Yeah, by John Carroll Cruz. Joan yeah, absolutely, Cruz. John Carroll Cruz. I've, I've had that book for 20 years. Yeah. But I've never really picked it up. But then when I found that Sister Wilhelmina was incorrupt, yeah. I said, oh, i got to read this. Yeah. And when I preached the sermon on Sunday to the nuns, it was about just general information about incorruptibles and yeah. the stories yeah. of some of the saints. Oh, I often corrupt. I often tell people, if you want to introduce somebody, may not be of faith whatsoever, there's the book to start with. Good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, almost done with it. Yeah, people want, they need, and their Lord responded to miracles, and nothing, nothing wrong. I'm often baffled as to why we hide these things. I think I had mentioned I, I did a former show with a great friend departed now, Brother Alphonsus Maria, on mystical union, and that was my question about why are we so hush about uh, such extraordinary phenomena and makes all the sense that these these beautiful souls were so blessed that their body stayed incorrupt as well, which speaks powerfully about purity, doesn't it? <laughs> I think that might be, oh, yeah. a, might be a common denominator amongst them all. But continue on uh, with regard to your hopes about this devotion and how you're going to spread it. It's obviously very much in the category category of reparation. And maybe I don't think we touch too heavily on exactly what reparation is and how does reparation differ from other forms of prayer. We, we have adoration, thanksgiving, petition, one's work is prayer, etc. Where is reparation in the hierarchy? Sure. So those are the four ends of sacrifice. And petition is usually the beginning. Yeah. of anyone in the spiritual life because yeah. they ask for things. That's what children are. Yeah. They depend on their mom and dad. Without them, they wouldn't survive yeah. when they were infants. And so that one's easy. And then to be thankful is the next one because when we receive something we've asked for, we should be thankful. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's one of the ends of sacrifice okay. to God. Okay. And then the other one is adoration, is to giving God what is his due. That's called religion. Okay. So there's that. And then reparation, I... My opinion is, it's like the last of the four that's practiced. Okay. Because reparation requires us to have a certain understanding of 
a relationship between God and ourselves and theology. Mm. And so reparation is repairing the damage between God and our human family. And so reparation can be singular, you know, of our own sins. We need a rep- reparation for but it's also a corporate thing. Okay. Just like petitioning is, too. Okay. So this devotion is about repairing the damage that we've done as a human family, all seven billion of us yep. on this earth at this moment, Okay. to God. And so that's why Jesus came to tell Sister Mary St. Pierre to stress something that we already knew, but to stress it, that my father is greatly disappointed with the human family mm. for blasphemy mm. and for not adoring, you know, not worshiping God on the Sabbath, on Sunday. Right, right. So this devotion is saying we've got to get that right. If we're going to get the other commandments right. We've got to get the first three. Exactly. This uh, reparation really unites us to the suffering Christ, doesn't it? And I am wondering, I should share with you, I should share with you right now because I'm a little under the weather because I had some bad cookies last night. <laughs> and oh, uh, they did they did a number on my stomach. And and I was determined, I was absolutely determined that we're gonna we're gonna plow through this. <laughs> yeah. And we're gonna and we're gonna we're gonna make reparation, you see. And and I'm my my sister at the current time uh, is sick and I'm I said to the Lord, Father, help us help us do a good job here and unite my sufferings right now for Julie. Can we do that? Absolutely. And I just want to stress how when people get involved with this devotion, mm. many times God then presents us the gift of some kind of physical suffering. Okay. And it's really beautiful because he only gives that gift of suffering for souls that are advancing and mm. spiritualizing can take that instead of drinking milk, they can eat real meat. And right. That's the meat of the spiritual life is to have sufferings that we don't place on ourselves. It's good to do penance that's inflicted, you know, by ourselves with the approval of our spiritual director or confessor. Mm, mm. But it's even more meritorious to accept the sufferings that God puts upon us that we don't inflict on ourselves. Right. So it, it doesn't surprise me that you've got an issue. And I've had an issue for five years, and there's a lot of people that have chronic illnesses. And this shouldn't scare people away. Right. Right. Because St. John Hughes, in a book about the priesthood, said that it's beautiful when God visits priests with suffering, even chronic suffering. Yes. And he says that God loves those priests to have that, to endure that in a, in a very particular way. Yeah. And the suffering here is much less than purgatory. He says it's a thousand times less. Right. And then suffering here is meritorious versus purgatory. It's not meritorious. Speak to the distinction between some kind of masochistic spirit versus this invitation to suffering on on your own to Jesus, that some of the saints, there's no question, they prove they're head of the class because it seems to me that some of them are really out and out asking uh, for increased suffering. Am I incorrect in that? Yeah, there's Padre Pio, many things talked about it, but I remember him yeah. talking about how some souls are ready to become victims of love. Okay. But that's something that no one should ever ask for. Okay. Unless they ask their confessor or spiritual director. And, very, very good. You know, Saint, yeah, Saint um, Louis Martin, who was the father. Yeah. Of Saint Charles of Lisieux, he asked to be a, a victim of love, and the last five years of his life, he was in an asylum wow. because he, he mentally lost it. Wow. And it seems like in the eyes of the world that that was a really a bad thing that happened to him. But really, mm. the secret is that that offering was accepted by God, and now he's got ST in front of his name. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, Emily Rose. Yes, a, a pious soul. People think that people that are possessed by the evil one, oh, they must have done something terribly wrong in their life or whatever, but not not necessarily, huh? That's right. And people that are possessed, usually it's because they've got a problem. Right. But it is rare, and it does happen, that people that are possessed, it's because that's the royal world of suffering that God has chosen for that particular choice goal. Right. And that's a great means of perfection, is to have that inflicted on someone by God. And I don't know, but that's where it's... Inflicted isn't the best word. I can't even think of the best word. Mm. 
when suffering is put upon us, but when God visits the souls with that, mm. it's a great means for them to perfection. Like St. Alfonso Gori, his book called The Great Ways and Means of Perfection and Salvation, that book is I highly recommend to people mm. because it teaches people how to participate in those four ends of sacrifice, especially reparation. Okay, very good. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Relative to Emily Rose, I remember where she basically it was, sounded like a life after life experience she had died and she was on her way to heaven and our lady had asked her okay do you want to come in or is there any possibility you could do a little more work for our lord and she chose the latter Unbe unbelievable because the thing is when the saints get to be at that level they see that their time on earth is a time of merit where they can do more for the kingdom of god to bring more accidental glory to God. Mm. And by doing that, they're going to get a higher place in heaven. Right. So the demonic, they can't stand it when souls fight against them because each time that a soul overcomes temptation from the devil mm. by asking God for help, their throne in heaven it gets higher and higher. And that, they are so jealous of that. <laughs> God wins every time, doesn't he? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it, it is, um, you know, I'm thinking of some of the impediments to people responding to the call in their life to ministry of whatever variety. And this is sometimes that which scares them a little bit, what we're talking about right here. I think, you know, for a young man or young woman, they think that that road to suffering is uh, somehow kind of loaded with a lot of morbidity or something, you know, it's just, but in fact, it's paradoxically just the opposite, isn't it? Right, because it's done in God's will. Yes. And that's when everything becomes sweet, even though the suffering is painful, nonetheless. Yeah. It's yeah. sweetened by, by God, and there's three levels in the interior life, according to the great Dominican, in the primitive way, is mm. the beginning. Mm. That's where people are still in mortal sin, and they don't have the light to see these things that we're talking about. Right. They can be scared of them. So they need to get through being attached to some mortal sin yeah. to get to the next level, which is the illuminative way. And then God starts to illumine them and give them light to show them, wait a minute, there's a lot of wisdom mm. in the suffering. Because look at the cross. Yeah. And the power, uh, you know, I think of St. Anthony, I mean, he raised eight people from the dead or something. You know, or, uh, the, some of the, the uh, stories of St. Patrick are extraordinary where they've been clearly given special graces, you know, to exhibit our Lord's miraculous grace. And it makes you wonder whether it's all there for the asking and we just don't ask. <laughs> uh, particularly for the priests, I, I think that they just too often don't understand the power in their holy hands alone, you know, but... Well, but it, we're living in modernism. And you know, speak to that modernism. a little bit. Yeah, modernism is that synthesis of errors that St. Pius X was trying to fight against in the early 1900s. Yeah. These errors were finding their way inside the seminaries, and he saw that if this got in, this was going to spread and be like a cancer. Yeah. And so it did. It came in, it spread like a cancer, and now we live and breathe modernism and all these errors. So the interior life hasn't had a chance to come out to be taught by the pop to the popular folks to the people in the pews i totally and even agree to the yeah. priest yeah even to the priest yeah and so that's why i've decided to write this book on the interior life which is the popular version mm. of the three ages of the interior life that father garrigo lagrange wrote it's a vol it's two volumes and he wrote of a thousand pages and modernism blocked that from ever act getting yep. promulgated you know matriculating down to everybody, the priest and the, and the people. I know. So I'm trying to uh, get another stab at getting this interior life out to people because this cuts through the interference that's coming from the world of flesh and the devil. The devil's really got a lot of power right now. He's on a rage. If we engage in interior life, yeah. like this devotion to the holy faith of Jesus, this devotion's drawing me and people that are in it, that have been in it for like five years, they're, God's drawing us to a very high level of interior life. Yep. So there's a lot of Catholic men that are traditional minded and they're leaders. Yep. And I'm talking to some of them, CEOs like of TAN publishers and you know the La Punta Institute and Our Lady, you know, the Fatima Center. 
these guys are moving towards the interior line. And yeah. It's a very beautiful thing to see. I think Father Ripperger's having a lot to, a lot a lot of influence. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah. he, he's just teaching on, like you say, this is, uh, you know, spirituality, basically, but it, it's not your intro course at the undergraduate level, typically, uh, which is very sad. I, I'm thinking that so much of this gravitation towards the spiritual life and its depth and authenticity has so much to do with one's family. And I, one of the questions I posed for you had to do with the domestic church and the importance of sacramentals within family life. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Before I tell you about that, I, you know, the Catholic is a sacramental. Priests wear the habit. Yeah. Is a sacramental. The religious wear, and then the domestic church. There's probably about a thousand sacramentals. Mm. And one thing I tell people is. Set a place apart in your house. If you can make it a whole room, make a chapel. Yep, yep, yep. If you can't, then get a corner. I agree. Make it a prayer corner and start asking for beautiful Catholic art for yep. Christmas or, you know, for the end of quarter bonus, you know, from your husband or whatever. Yeah. And don't just buy cheap trinkets. No. Get some really nice stuff and have it blessed by a priest. Have the devotion to the Holy Face has for the object the Bell of Veronica that's been touched to the, you know, the copies have been touched to the Bell of Veronica. Yeah. There's those relics, or people can simply buy a copy and have it blessed, and they can have a oil lamp burning day yeah. and night. Awesome. That infrared light rising and setting up a beautiful light that yeah. draws people to peace. Yeah. But having that all the time in your house. Absolutely. It, it draws people to pray more. <laughs> for human beings, the rosaries, we need to have the beads to fill the prayers going by. Absolutely. So, Someday I hope you'll see my home. <laughs> it's a, it is a retreat house that I am in the process of building here, and it's, I've got the sacramentals. In fact, in your honor, I will say, I went online and uh, bought a little uh, reliquary of the Holy Face just the other day. I, 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 wow. don't, I don't know when it'll be coming, but which begs the next question about first, second, and third class relics. Can you tell us, God's people, what that's all about? Sure. So third class relics, those are things that have been touched to a relic. So okay. let's start the relic. So a relic is a saint. It's their body, parts of their body, hair, bone, yep. skin. So that's a first class relic. And a second class, something they wore when they were alive. Okay. And then a third class relic is is touching something to their body okay to the first class relic okay so when you go to a catholic bookstore is it mostly third class relics that you're probably buying that's right yes yeah and they should never be bought or sold the relics themselves okay but the container of course can be right because we can't get into commerce with relics oh i want a hand of that saint so i think that's worth like thousand right. dollars <laughs> Well, that's called simony because yep. Simon Magnus talked to Peter and Paul or to Peter and wanted to buy yep. the grace that he saw was given out by the sacraments. And Peter scolded and said, basically, shame on you. <laughs> this, this thought does not come from God in your heart. Yeah, I did notice some big prices on a few things while I was there <laughs> online. <Yeah. laughs> you know, I can, you know, this, this can get a little out of control uh, give people reason to go up, back into the Middle Ages and bring up all the sins. <laughs> yeah, now, you've had a little difficulty. Uh, you had a question about in starting the crusade. It, it hasn't been just a, a yellow brick road. Uh, been some difficulties or impediments along the way? Any, anything you can share? Yeah, with the art, with starting the League of St. Martin. Okay. Yeah, so I, I did start a community called the Canons Regular of St. Martin of Tours. Okay. And we were all Latin Mass and... Our plan was to chant three of the offices every day mm -hmm. and then to go out into the streets to save souls. That's awesome. But then I was visited with all kinds of strange events that eventually led to my health that I almost died in 2019. Oh, really? And I got through that by the grace of God and I disbanded the community okay. and went to the Abbey where I was the chaplain and resided there for three and a half years. Mm. And Mother Abbas told me, maybe this is the time for a prayer and discernment. So I got three and a half years of prayer and discernment 
Beautiful. And in that time, I decided to change it from the canon's regular St. Martin, a religious community, to the League of St. Martin, okay. which is a pious association of the faithful. So in that prayer, mm. it seemed to me that God wanted me to be a promoter of the devotion to the holy faith. Beautiful. Nonetheless, I've had a chronic illness ever since I really got deep into this devotion. And that's no problem. I think it's one of the best blessings God has ever given to me. You still have it, right? To give this to me. Wow. I still have it. Wow. Yeah, basically, we don't know exactly what it is, yeah. but my doctors are saying that it's parasites, and we've gotten rid of a lot of parasites. Huh. So, and I got those probably when I was in Peru because I drank the water when I was oh, like boy. a little, you know, a 20-year-old yep. know-it-all guy. I, I drank the water despite them, the warning, and I had a stomach ache for a month. But nonetheless, in God's providence, he's weaved us into the path, hopefully, that will, will lead me to heaven. Absolutely. And like Sister Mary St. Pierre, she died in the order of sanctity when she was only like 27. Mm -hmm. And then Venerable Leo de Pont, the great apostle of this devotion to the Holy Faith, yep. he had arthritis mm. for decades, and he would go to Lourdes like every year, and he would never get cured. Yet, he cured 6,000 people. So, wow. you know, why did God keep him wow. ill? Because there was so much merit there. Absolutely. That he had. Absolutely. Wow. That's incredible. I'm thinking of all these canceled priests. I just got a, a text from a dear friend just recently uh, about a, a, a wonderful, young, traditional, faithful Catholic priest, and uh, they're trying to give him the bounce. And uh, now their parish is trying to rally the troops behind them and all the rest. I mean, how did we get <laughs> how did we get to this place? And is it the lack of devotions that yeah. may be causing so much of the, uh, the, the you know, the turbulence. Yes, a, a very wise priest told me something, and I'm going to repeat what he said. Mm. He said, God wants the world to have a great number of very holy priests, and that's in God's mercy. Yes. But when there's a, a dearth of respect for God, like in blasphemy, the yeah. you know, whole human family, in his justice, he can't give those holy priests out. And so in his justice, he has to take them away. Okay. Walk. Okay. Withdraw. That's right. Yeah. And so I think that's why my goal is to have a million people enroll <laughs> before uh, I die. Awesome. <laughs> because that's getting a million people to get to volunteer to say, God, I'm going to raise my hand and yeah. I'm going to just abandon myself to divine providence and I'm going to try to grow deeper in the interior life. And if you want to visit me with suffering, yeah. it's up to you. Yeah. I don't want any more pain. Yeah. Or any less pain than what you want. Right. Yeah. Only what you want. And if we get a million people to do that, it's yeah. over for the enemy. Always a good note to leave on, Father. Thank you from WQPH Radio. We will look forward to your visit right here in Massachusetts come August. God bless you and all your work. We'll do it again. Through Mary to Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening to another edition of WQPH's Local Matters. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast and hope you have a blessed week.